Hello, everybody. I am Amy Donsigny. I'm the director of the Inspired and Rooted Programs. Programs at the Canada Council, donc un des uh, six programmes. So one of the six, the six main uh, programs. Most of you know my program because you probably get help from the program. Inspiré en Racine, either as an arts institution or as an artistic catalyzer. And I'd like to thank all of those who have joined us at the Council this morning for an information session on the next deadline, the 9th of October, for the uh, requests for this component. So thank you very much for the invitation to uh, come speak to you today. It's Alexis Andrew. I am the Director of Granting Program Operations, which is a new title for me. Uh, up till very recently, I was the Director of Research Evaluation and Performance Measurement at the Council, and this is actually my last hurrah in that role, my last uh, public appearance. So um, I'd, I'd want to say on behalf of MA and I and uh, all of the people who've worked on the projects that you're going to see today, a big thank you to Catherine Carlton and to the team here at Orchestras Canada for the invitation and for the warm welcome. Um, we are aware that we are the last thing standing between you and dinner or any other... Or drinks. <laughs> or drinks. Or <laughs> so we'll try and keep this uh, light and interesting and uh, hopefully pique your curiosity about some of the work that we've been doing. Bon, uh, je vais parler brièvement. I'm going to talk quickly of what exactly is the research service at the Council, what's our mandate, what do we do, how do we work, and here we go. Or I will be advancing the English and Nick will be advancing ah, okay, the French cool. and we'll see and he will remind me when I forget because it will happen. Um, donc, uh, so the research department is a small team, we're about 10 people, but we work closely with program with the program, Emmy's program, for a while now. And I think that the three proje projects that we'll be presenting today, in fact, were done in collaboration with Emmy's team. That's why we are doing the presentation together. The research section at the Canada Council is, uh, is has a multiple number of factors. First of all, we want to support decision making within the Council. We are responsible for all of the production of grant statistics and data within the Council, so if you've ever visited the lovely Stats and Stories page, the Shift des Histoires, that is the production of the, the team, uh, the research team. Um, but also, more largely, the, the intention is really to be able to try and demonstrate the impact of public funding for the arts and of the arts sector in general. And this is done both internally by the researchers and analysts and evaluators at the Council and also externally with many partners and with commissioned uh, researchers. So some of the things that you may be familiar with are things like the Culture Satellite account, Le Compte Satellite pour la Culture, um, et uh, les travaux qui sont... And the works done by Hill Strategy. Research is funded and directed in part by the Canada Council and a shout out to Canadian Heritage, who is often our partner on many things, including the Hill Strategies work and the uh, Culture Satellite account. Um, and Richard can always jump in if he wants to correct anything. Um, today we're going to talk about three projects that are of particular interest to the orchestra's community uh, and to the arts sector in general, and that two of which are uh, still in progress, so you're going to get some advance uh, information about some of them, and then the final one is something that was published about two weeks ago, and I think most of you have, were hopefully sent um, some information about it, but it is available on the website. Voila. So for each of my little mini project profiles, I'm going to answer a few questions, and the first one is, why are we doing the research? C'est toujours important quand on fait de la recherche. It's always important when we do research to really target why we do this work because research must be useful in some way, especially when we're an institution like the Arts Council. We don't do research just uh, for personal interest or as to the community. Um, secondly, we're going to talk about how we're doing it and then finally what we hope to achieve. And then we'll talk a little bit for each of these about what we see as the impact or benefit for you as orchestras. Donc, je vais commencer. I'm going to begin at a really macro level. We're going to 
we're going to go to a, the sectorial side and then we're going to go directly to a research project that uh, is for symphonic orchestra specifically doing on an impact framework and i really want to start by uh, doing a shout out to say that this has been a big project uh, and a huge team effort, both internally and externally. And I want to say thank you to Catherine Carleton, who has been on our advisory for this since the very beginning. It has been a long and complex and um, sometimes uh, murky process, uh, but we are advancing on it. And also, uh, many of you are, uh, know Shannon Pete, who was a music officer for many years, and she's been the project lead on this. So, um, so what is it? So. To start with, uh, we identified a few years ago that there was a gap in terms of our sort of evidence base, the toolkit that we use to talk about the value and to understand the impact of the arts. We have the really high level data on economic impact, like the culture satellite account. We have program level information where we get an idea of what the impact is directly from the grants that we give, but we have somewhat of a gap in terms of how we understand overall what the impact of public funding is. Um, we also uh, noticed, as we were looking at our work, that there was a really heavy reliance on quantitative information, which you'll see as we go through the presentation, uh, and, and a focus for us really on what is the value of what we do? What is the value of what you do? And how can we better understand and explain that to ourselves, to the communities that we are in, and to various uh, decision makers for us as, as a government institution. We also have to make our own case, but also for you in terms of your explanations of the value that you bring. Um, so we, we engaged a firm, which I think many of you probably are aware of, uh, Wolf Brown. They do a lot of audience research in the States and around the world. They are experts in terms of understanding intrinsic value which is what we're terming this black box of how do we understand the, uh, the non-economic or non-quantitative value that is uh, rendered through the funding that we provide to organizations and to artists. So we worked with them to understand what that model might look like in terms of public funding. We worked with our advisory committee um, and we've done a, a long series of consultations with other funders, with service organizations, and just recently with uh, arts organizations in a number of cities across the country. And some of you participated in those. Uh, they were in uh, Vancouver, Halifax, and Quebec City. Sorry, blanking on this. And they were, they've just been completed. So we're in a process right now of understanding what the feedback has been and how this might adjust this model. And the model really starts with the investment in the artist and the arts organization, understanding what value the investment brings to them, the work that is created itself, which has an intrinsic value, the impact of the programming that organizations provide to Canadians, to participants, and then the long-term social benefits and individual benefits that the arts bring to society and to communities. So it's quite comprehensive. But within that, we have a research agenda. We're not going to try and prove the whole thing from start to finish. It will be done through a series of research projects over the next few years. The aim is really that we will collect rigorous evidence over time that will help us to shape a different narrative, a more comprehensive narrative around the value of arts funding. And that we will also, by working in collaboration with the sector, be able to build capacity to tell that story and to understand what those impacts really are in the, in the sector. So one of the, uh, I'm, I'm quite happy today to have a, a council colleague uh, vouching for things that I have, I have been saying to the community these past few years in, in, in regards to what underpinned the change to the granting programs. Um, one thing that I often mention to orchestras is that we know the value you have in your community. We know the domino effect that you have, not only in your audiences, but in your community in general. Even people who never attend a concert of a symphony orchestra view them as kind of a crucial element of the infrastructure of their region or city or town. Uh, and 
we, we are convinced of that value, and you are, or you wouldn't be able to do the work that you do in the, in, in the circumstances that you do it if you, don't, if you didn't believe that. Uh, but it is perceived outside of that feedback loop of the arts as a conversation between interested parties that just congratulate or self-reference the, their own arguments to each other. The council gives you money because you will bring impact to Canadians and then you get your grant and you're like, thank you council, I bring impact to Canadians. And then we put that you said that you bring impact in our report <laughs> to Treasury Board that we had impact. And uh, in, in periods where uh, austerity is the main conversation or there are hard choices to make between education and health and the arts or anytime there's a pressure that might impact arts funding or your capacity to get uh, a, a funding that is uh, free from operational reality of box office like or or sponsorship so money that enables you to be free from political interference which is the, what underpins council's funding uh, and we wanted to really break that perception that we were in a continuous feedback loop where we said and heard what we expected to say and hear. However, and that's what really came up in that work, is that initially we were looking at, well, let's simply collect that impact. And what was interesting is that just trying to solve that issue of how can we collect it actually triggered a more fundamental question, which is how can we have a sound, a sound framework to be able to say this is not just some kind of lofty, I love the arts, hence it has intrinsic impact conversation, but it actually is informed by how other sectors have been demonstrating impact beyond the strictly bums and seats qual qualitative aspect. I know that you've probably used some of argu some arguments like every dollar invested in my organization leads to and nobody listens anymore. Some qualitative arguments hold no sway anymore. But we felt that we could provide to the community and to council a framework where eventually, piece by piece, bit by bit, we would be able to not only help you demonstrate your value and better understand strategically how you're in that relationship of intrinsic value within your community, but for council to be able to roll up those success, those efforts, those accomplishments in a way that can really synthesize, uh, synthesize sorry, the value of public arts funding. Et on a toujours trouvé que c'était très... And we always found that it was very important to avoid what other arts councils have done when they tried to say that to tell these stories with certain data that quickly took on water because they were purely eco economical or that the data was mixed in with with data from other sectors and our strategy to avoid these problems was to have tools whereby the value is mutual so that you in the sector can use the results of this research for your own descriptions of how your organization fits into the community and has impact, but also for the sector as a whole to be able to continue to present these arguments on a basis that is promising. So this is a a very nice objective and that seems to be very far away and that's why we've always thought it was fascinating this notion of th that emerges from the this framework that is that it's not the the council who will solve this problem but this this council can be a catalyzer so that your partnerships perhaps with the health sector or with the local university or other stakeholders or other activities that you do and other research projects that can exist independently of us in other universities or elsewhere in the world and those that we have the capacity of doing so that they can be offered, mined and used to the benefit of this conversation on the value, the intrinsic value, so of your impact. What I think is important is that when we're when we're looking at this at this work, we see um, that it is not something that we can own. 
we are. Uh, it's bigger than us. We, it's much bigger than us. However, we feel like we have a role in terms of being able to instigate conversations and instigate uh, reflection on these issues that, uh, that we assume. So um, we are working to establish some partnerships, looking at some academic uh, institutions and different bodies that we can work with to be able to stimulate uh, a larger and more comprehensive look at how we understand what is that impact when someone actually experiences the work because that is one of the key pieces of this black box that we would like to try and start slowly picking away at. I'll keep moving along because I know what time it is. Um, donc, uh, je... So to loop the loop here, as I said, we are revising the framework with the information that we receive through our consultations. And this will lead us to really establish a type of agenda for research for the years to come with methodologies, with approaches, with partnerships, so as to establish how we will begin to answer key questions that are asked of us uh, by us and by our sector, actually. We want to have a publication of the framework later in the year. It's not quite clear yet, especially with the election that's coming, that is uh, putting a certain cap on what we can do publicly. So. It remains to be determined when this will be published. And that's the same thing for the next project. Just one other thing that uh, uh, came out loud and clear in the consultations, and you, some of your colleagues probably already shared that, hey, I was at the Halifax consultation, and is that this, the same journey we were on, on understanding what is qualitative impact, what is intrinsic value, all those concepts so for us to get to definition and methodologies to collect it, we need to pursue the conversation with you on how you define impact. Where do you see it? Where is it relevant? So it's a longer arc, but it's not a longer arc where you don't hear about us until 15 years from now when we will have solved it. It really is just a starting point for a much longer organic conversation that we'll have with you in the coming years so that we, the framework can not just be theoretical, but have a real pragmatic value. Merci. Donc, uh, maintenant so now I will go from the macro level to the meso level. <laughs> and so I'll talk of an issue that preoccupies us all and that requires a certain type of rigor, type of research and a judicious application of how we broach the issue. Um, there is increasing scrutiny of agencies like the Council and uh, the funding that we give to institutions and to organizations and understanding how representative they are of the sector and the community that they work with. Um, this is established as a performance measure in some of our programs, but we didn't actually have data on it. Uh, we don't know exactly who works within the organizations that you run and what their profile is. <clears throat> Um, we know that, uh, that this is something that has been looked at by different arts councils and different agencies around the world with some success and some challenges, challenges. I would say. Uh, and so we, we started actually a number of years ago to look at this issue. Um, we, we began back in 2015-16 where we did an initial uh, literature review looking at both the uh, practices of other funders and how they had done this kind of uh, collection of data on workforces. And then we also looked, we did a very extensive look at the privacy and ethical implications of doing this. What are the different privacy rules across the country? What are the legal implications for us to be asking this kind of information? And how might we do this in a way that is going to be uh, empowering um, give people data that they can use, but also protects both us, the organizations, and the individuals right. within this process. This has been a, a real um, sticking point for me through all of this, that there is, there is no, what I have heard termed about how some others have done it, naming and shaming of organizations. This is not useful. 
Uh, we don't want anyone individually to be exposed in terms of their identity. So it has been a really long process for us to come to uh, an approach that we felt comfortable with. Um, so we then uh, sat on this for a little while. Some things happened at the Canada Council. You know, a bunch of programs changed apparently. Um, and then we, <laughs> we came back to it. And uh, we started again to look at how do we actually implement this. So the first thing that we did uh, once we had hired the consultants that we worked with who are Forum Research, a very reputable uh, survey firm, and Hill Strategies, who did a lot of the background work for us, is we looked at how other sectors and other arts councils have done this in terms of the actual survey questions. We looked at Statistics Canada questions. We looked at um, different, uh, different ways of collecting data. Uh, we had a, quite an extensive examination of this. Um, so all of this was part of us building our knowledge and our understanding of the best practices about this so that we could collect data that we felt confident in and that the process was, um, was solid. So then we uh, piloted the survey, and um, I will talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, but I think it's really important to note that, that we have two goals within the pilot that we have, we've just run. What, the first was to test the survey tool. Are people answering the questions? Do they understand it? Do they feel like it um, reflects them? It's not too intrusive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, are people ready to engage with this? And then the second was to actually receive some feedback from the consultants about how we might look at future implementation of this on a broader scale. What worked, what didn't work? How might we look at this in terms of, of an ongoing or periodic process? Um, it's <laughs> Do you want me to keep going a little bit and then I'll pass it over? I think so. Whenever yeah. you want. Yeah. Donc, le sondage. So the survey itself was, the, we did the development and we had a consultation with representatives from artistic organizations and service organizations. There was a representative from the orchestra sector too. In fact, your colleague, Mr. Chris Wilkinson and Therese Boutin were two of the people who were part of a larger group of consultants, sorry, participants in the, from the sector and the visual arts uh, theater and in both official languages to get feedback on the first version of this survey. So once again, thank you for, to everyone who participated, especially thank you to those who participated I'm sorry, it's inaudible. National, uh, art, thank you, National Arts Service Organization. Uh, we always do that, sorry. There might be other, we're forewarning you, other weird acronyms might pop up. Which okay, <laughs> we don't see them anymore. <laughs> um, so finally, we sent the survey to 25 institutions. And it was, these were institutions who were invited. It was not compulsory. Everybody, it was voluntary to participate or not. Everyone who was invited accepted. And we have truly have to thank everybody who participated because a lot of work, it was more work than we would have thought. There were four orchestras who participated. We had uh, different regions, different sizes, different disciplines, business models. The threshold, however, was that the institution had to have at least 20 employees. And to, for that, it was because we wished to share the data with the institutions. And so if there was a smaller sample, we weren't sure that there would be a significant number of responders to share the information and to respect information safety, security. Limits of our sandbox due to privacy laws. Uh, and, and that's why the, the lit review was so critical before we even considered a pilot because they're, why didn't you simply send one survey to HR instead of pestering all of my staff for two months with reminders about your survey council? It's like, because literally we can't ask your HR department to do head counting. It is, it's, it's illegal. So, uh, and there are other differences at the province level that we had to respect. So, yeah. Thanks, those, so those constraints, <laughs> those constraints were real, but they spoke to the care that we we uh, brought to that uh, to that process. On that point, I just want to make sure that everyone is clear that the way that the survey was done is that 
It was sent to a contact person in each organization who then distributed it to employees and to boards who then had the opportunity to self-identify. And this is critical because, as MA said, the, the, the legal line is pretty fuzzy on it, but basically, really, no one should be making a determination about someone's identity. So I shouldn't be saying that, you know, you are a woman and you are a man. I don't know that for sure. Um, and I certainly shouldn't be saying that someone has a disability or uh, someone has a cultural identity that I can't be sure of. We also had concerns about asking the HR departments to do this based on personnel records because we would then have to be sure that they are storing this data according to privacy rules. So this is where we differed from, for example, our colleagues in, uh, in England, and I know we have a colleague here from England who um, have a, a different approach to it. They, there are some different privacy rules there, and the Arts Council England actually has designation as a statistical body. We do not. So we have certain restrictions on what we can do. This, this meant that it was a hard, it was a hard process. Um, but we also feel that uh, we were getting data that people felt comfortable sharing. So that's really important to that's, us. Yeah, I think that we, we, we have to make sure that that's clear that people have the right to say no. Yeah. And, and we're completely fine with that. It's council will never force you to, dis, to divulge or, or, or give information that you don't feel is pertinent to share. So it not, not only to, to, to manage people's sensibility, sensibilities about their own identity, but your fundamental right to say, I'm not telling you how I identify in your government survey. And that also is one of your legitimate rights, and including uh, yeah. for your employees. Uh, and that actually meant that every single question had a prefer not to answer. So people could opt in and out. They could answer questions they felt comfortable answering and not ones that they didn't feel comfortable. And we're looking at what that pattern was because it also tells you whether or not a question feels intrusive or unclear. So these are things we're looking at. As you can see, we had actually a really big sample size. Given that we sent it to 25 organizations, we had almost 3,000 people who were sent the survey, including employees. And trust me, finding out what an employee is in an organ arts organization was a complicated process. That is varies by sector. <laughs> Very different. <laughs> uh, and we had uh, just over 1,000 responses, which is a response rate of 37% overall, which is a really respectable response Really good for surveys rate. in general. However, the response rate by organization varied widely. So we had some response rates that were up in the 70 to 80 percent and others that were down in the 10 to 15 percent. So um, this is all part of our learning around how we manage this and how we ensure that the, the process is not onerous um, and that people feel welcomed and that they can, they can engage with it. The, um, the questionnaire had three sections. And the first one was about employment. It's things like, how long have you been in the organization? Uh, what's your level of seniority? Were you hired at that level or were you promoted to it? Um, what is, what's your average annual income? Um, so the basics around the employment. Then we asked a series of questions about the demographics, um, age and uh, cultural identity and uh, gender, um, sexual orientation, really wide, wide range of questions. Uh, and then finally, we asked a number of questions that were um, closed questions, I will explain in a second why, about their perception of diversity in the sector. So how diverse do they think the sector is? How diverse they think they're, how important they think certain issues are for their organization? <coughs> and how they think their organization is doing within, with regards to these, these questions. These were closed questions, as in you tick boxes. And this was because when we had originally started this, we got an advice, this was a few years ago, around the importance of having this kind of qualitative experience that just counting isn't enough. However, we started to have some serious concerns about getting uh, disclosure, that if an individual disclosed to us something like harassment or discrimination, that we would then have to do something with that information, and we are not a tribunal, and this is a research project. It is not something where we felt at all like we could receive that kind of information um, and safely deal with it. Um, oh boy, time ticks by, doesn't it? It's because it's fascinating. <laughs> 
<laughs> because there's a lot of content. <laughs> there is a lot of content. It's really, I, and I, I have to say, this project has been one of my babies. I really, I think it's it's um, it's critically important for everyone to understand how we can we can advance this. Um, donc, la la prochaine show. So the next thing with all of this is that we are in the data analysis, and the data will be shared with the organizations who participated. So that's the first step. When it's once all the data has been cleaned, as it were, there will be uh, dashboards that will be shared with organizations. These are data that are, of course, anonymous and aggregated. You cannot see who answered what, and the sample must be of a certain size to be able to share the information. So if there's less than 10 answers in a category, we can't give the information. So we do our best to protect the identity of the in different individuals. After that, there shall be a report on the aggregated data of, of all the uh, institutions that participate and will be published later. And the Council will also receive a recommendations report simply. Uh, so how the future, how in the future we can foresee this type of survey that will be administered to a broader sample or with all the institutions or organizations who are financed by the council that have who have programs a certain criteria in regards to diversity because we have to be clear that we as an institution cannot ask for data that are not useful in program management does not have any criteria around diversity we can't ask these questions so there's something called policy authority that gives us the right to ask for certain pieces of information. And if we don't have it, we don't, we can't ask it. So for an organization that has three staff, we're probably not going to be asking it. And this is where I jump in, in regards <laughs> to the Engage and Sustain program. So uh, again, when we launch those uh, new programs, the question was asked immediately. It may, there's a 30 percent of your of your of the overall score for my organization in your program that is about engagement and reflecting the diversity of the community that i serve how do i know if i'm doing good or not will you impose quotas will how will that work because there have been a lot of examples of similar work elsewhere in other uh, countries or other states in uh, in our uh, neighbor from the south uh, that took various approaches linking uh, those issues uh, with funding in a way that, and that's what the initial literature review also revealed. So we found out that even the most progressive states, such as state of New York or state of California or other uh, countries, uh, um, uh, European countries, particularly Arts Council England, all those initiative yielded almost no results. 20 years of equity principles and engagement programs have not significantly changed the workforce or the diversity of the workforce in some sectors in the arts. So like, I, like we said at the beginning of the uh, presentation, there was no way that council would simply commit again the same mistakes or if we're launching in that work, we would try to overcome those uh, th those pitfalls that we know about because they happen elsewhere. Also, Council said we wanted to achieve real change. Real change is not quick change. Real change is being a catalyst on a much longer arc for that conversation. And we also knew that our communities evolved. They evolved in front of our eyes. And especially orchestra, where the relevancy to your immediate audience and, and your community, not the, not the artistic community, the community in which your, your hall and your offices are located, you are attuned to the evolution of that community or else you wouldn't be able to survive in the, in the environment in which orchestras are operating. So we are conscious of that. Not only that. But Canada is truly is a mosaic, and there's no way that the situation in Halifax can be equated to the situation in Toronto or the situation in Timmins or the situation in uh, the, the suburbs of Edmonton. Like, and there's no one size fits all or kind of magic wand that council could use in, in good faith. 
We, we could have hand waved that question away, but we kind of foolishly tried to do significant uh, work forward. So I've been telling, and my program officers have been telling the applicants of the program for three years now, there are no quotas. We're not going into arbitrary metrics. We're not just asking for you to say, reach 5% of diverse staff. We know that you have blind auditions. We know that there, you're already reflecting in your administrative artistic uh, workforce, the community you serve in some part. But we also know that work needs to continue, that, that we have not achieved uh, a, a stability uh, in regards to some systemic barriers to access that, uh, that uh, immigrants, new, uh, uh, new Canadians, uh, or uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people have been uh, uh, facing. And diversity in a meritocratic blind audition process doesn't include necessarily your communication staff or your financial staff. Like there, there's a more holistic questions to have on those questions. But again, there was no way that council would do this just on a way that would be self-serving. It had to have a mutual value for you in the sector to feel that the tool would indeed give you a clearer picture of your community, of your own workforce, of your colleagues elsewhere in the country, that would you be able to eventually measure yourself, not by gauging among the stat scan uh, uh, amount of data if you're really making forays or lagging behind, which we are absolutely still not in any shape or form ready to, to, to measure or to, or to make any pronouncements of the sort. It has to be understood as a mutually beneficial, careful, and iterative approach so that the rights of individuals, but real change, ultimately gets accomplished to the betterment of our living together, which is also linked to what you're doing through your programming. It ultimately, it underpins your entire work, the, the, the overall betterment of, the, of your audiences and your, and your communities. So we're being, being very careful also because we're, we're quite aware of how those questions easily become a political football to the detriment of a real open-hearted, stable and, and, and honest living together that overcomes those barriers and, and systemic racism. Because it exists, not everywhere the same way, doesn't express itself the same way depending on where you work, what you do, the community you're in but also all our communities are changing, evolving, and your relevancy is crucial. And us being able to say that your relevancy is crucial is part of why we're doing that work. Peers have been asking us, both at the previous competition and this one, well, we'll give, will you give you, will please give us numbers so we can measure and, and, and rank uh, organizations against each other. And we said, we're not there yet because we made a promise that the tool would be significant, like the data can be used, that it makes sense for you. And then we have to have a very careful conversation on if and when it is deployed in assessment. It could be in peer assessment, but it could be through your reporting, through an, an end of a granting cycle. We have made no determination, none yet, of when, how, how long that tool would be rolled out in granting assessment or granting monitoring once you've had your grant. So when you report year after year on I did that activity and here's my stats in CADAC. So that is really important because there's been a lot of confusion and because the criteria speaks to you reflecting either in your governance and or your artistic programming and or your audiences, the diversity of the community you serve. You see, we've, we've put it very, very wide so that your context, in your words, in the way you understand what you do for your community is what is brought to the table to peers. And then currently peers, us, council program staff, and you as applicant all share that it's mutual trust of, tr of knowing that people know their sector well, they know what they can do and cannot do, where they're at, and that's where the assessment rests right now on these questions. 
we've seen already great strides, great process, uh, progress, some fantastic anecdote and activities that really pierce the wall of, of our mutual incomprehension among communities sometimes. But we also know that society as a whole is not there yet. And we know that those questions will continue to traverse, to kind of, to, to, to permeate the conversation around granting, because it is bigger than us. It's bigger than our art sector. And unfortunately, the art sector is unfortunately not on another plane, completely aside of the rest of society. We're embedded in society. So those questions will live and grow and continue to be in dialogue with how we operate and how we try to canalize what you do, where you're at, your knowledge on the ground into significant change. And significant change is meaningful change. Meaningful change is change that people can actually feel has a positive impact on their lives and the lives of others. I know it sounds very, very, oh my God, kumbaya lofty council. How counsel of you to try to fix the world through the arts? But uh, we feel that with your work, we can. So it's, it really informed how we approach that, uh, that project. Oh, can we, we're we'll taking questions at the end of the uh, uh, presentation. Get the last slides. We have one left. Yeah. And then we'll take some questions. Je sais qu'on est presque à la fin. We're almost at the end. Emekri loves the microphone. Um, okay, uh, last but not least, coming back to the quantitative data, the, the absolute, you know, all the lofty stuff, now let's come back down to earth. So uh, we have been over the last few years trying to slowly build a, a library of reports based on the data that is input into CADAC. Now, everybody here knows what CADAC is. Do I need to do a quick refresher? On the, on the, Avancé. Oui. CADAC, financial and statistical information from organizations receiving core funding from different levels of government. Um, so we have been uh, producing a number of reports over the years, and this year we have tackled opera and orchestra and th uh, francophone and anglophone theater companies. I have they been published yet? No, theater has not been published Coming yet. Coming this, this week, I think. Sorry, I'm... Uh... So, uh, we... What these reports do is that they look at the economic impact, they look at audience numbers, they look at access to the arts through enrichment activities and public participation, and they look at the financial performance of the organizations. This particular report, c'est un échantillon de 47 It's a sample of 47 orchestras that received a financing from the Council of Arts during the reference period, which was 2010 11 to 16-17. We do an analysis of several data sets to be able to give a quantitative portrait of the status of these organizations. On our website, this is the one you can actually take a look at. I was just on the website. It's a little hard to find. So you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that Catherine can, can send that out if you did not receive the bulletin that went out when it, uh, when it was published um, two weeks ago. Oh. So you can read that. I don't need to tell you more because let's get to the cut to the chase um, so overall the the picture is is uh, it's an interesting picture there's some trends that are trending up uh, we have seen total revenues increase over the reference period which has shown uh, uh, an increase in in earned revenues and one point that I found quite interesting as I was taking another look at the report this morning is that there's been an interesting shift in terms of funding fundraising from the corporate side to foundations that's where the growth has actually been uh, in terms of where the the private revenues are coming from um, there has also been uh, uh, growth in terms of uh, the revenues from admissions and box offices, which is about three quarters of the revenue from you in, during this period, 2016, 2017. 
Um, we've seen a growth in terms of the public performances. And also, quite interestingly, we've also seen a, a fairly significant growth in terms of the number of commissions of new works over that period. So kudos. Congratulations. I know those are sometimes hard to, to pull off. Uh, good attendance numbers over here in terms of the, uh, the period of uh, six, 2010 to 2017. <coughs> Almost 2 million attendees. Again, these numbers are not individuals. They are attendees. So we have double counting. We have people who've attended multiple concerts. They would be counted each time. So I, I always try to say this is not the number of Canadians who've attended. This is the number of attendees. It's a different question. Some things that, um, trends that I thought were quite interesting also included, there's been, we see a, a slight shift from full-time to part-time employment over the time period. Um, there is a, a relatively good and even balance between what we would like to see in terms of administrative and other costs. On terms of the financial position of the orchestras in the sample, it is trending upwards. Overall, most of the indicators show that there has been a stabilization. There is a better debt to assets ratio. Um, working capital has improved. If any of this is glazing you over, that's OK. However, we'd say in terms of the, the relationship to the national benchmark of all of the organizations in CADAC, the financial position is still a little bit less strong than we, would, we see in the overall. As, al as always, though, the average represents no one. This is you know, statistically, but I think there are some areas where we've seen some really uh, strong improvement over that time period. Now, this was obviously done in 2016-17, was the last locked year of data in CADAC, so there is some projected data also within the report that looks at what um, you have said in your CADAC projections. We expect over time, as we start to do these reports on a more cyclical basis, that we'll be able to look at uh, trends analysis in a more in-depth way, and eventually also start to look at some of the contextual issues. So the data tells us the, the, the status, but it doesn't tell us why. And so some of the, the questions and things that are raised in the report, I think, are of great interest in terms of being able to dig a little bit further and understand exactly what's going on. Why are we seeing certain trends or changes in terms of attendance or in terms of box office revenues? One small point there is we've seen um, that box office revenues have not grown as quickly as attendance has, which is an interesting fact. I can't answer why, but I bet you you can. And so I think there is some interesting potential for dialogue in terms of being able to put these numbers into context. When you have had a chance to look at the report, if you have any comments or questions or feedback about how it could be made more useful for you, it is your data. And we are trying to make this data be useful and to live in your uh, understanding and your usage, whether it's for your boards or for your own planning. So the more that this kind of report can be seen as a service that is actually helping you to make decisions, the better for everyone. So if there are um, points that you'd like to, to make in terms of how it could be improved, please, um, you know, you can either, I'm sure Catherine would be happy to pass the message along, or uh, you can always uh, email research at Canada Council. Um, I think we'll just end pretty much on that. Um, the, the final point really is that w as we're doing this kind of work, as MA has really um, emphasized, it's, it's critical that it be inclusive, that we find a way for this not to be research on or research about, but rather research with. And that and ultimately takes, research for. Yes. Um, and that's so that it actually has value for you. If, if, as a government institution, we're doing research that has no value for you, then we are not fulfilling our mandate. So uh, we hope that today uh, helped you to understand a little bit more about what um, some of the projects are that the Canada Council is undertaking through its research work and where we're going. And I think we might have a minute or two for questions.